to Summit Live. Now, this week has been a showcase for absolutely fantastic work that has gone over across the tech industry. And something that's very close to my heart is making sure that of the fantastic work that goes out there, uh, we highlight people who are doing amazing work. And as someone who is a very visible woman in tech, I want to take the opportunity to speak to people who are also doing really fantastic work in the industry. And so earlier this week, I sat down with three superstar women in the AI industry to talk to them about their experiences and their career. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for this segment. And today I am so thrilled to be able to sat with three very talented, influential women from the world of AI. And to get started, I'd like to say one, hello, and welcome to Data and AI Summit. Uh, and could you start by introducing yourselves? Sure, my name is Kate Osby. I'm a senior director for AI innovation and data science at Pfizer. I'm Lisa Cohen. I lead data science and analytics engineering at Anthropic. Hi, I'm Paul Levy. I am a research scientist here at Databricks on our reinforcement learning team. Okay then, so wonderful. Uh, you've all got very interesting jobs. Uh, they are all quite specialist in their own areas. So could you give us a bit of intro about, you know, how did you find your specialism? What is it that you liked about it? And like, what is it that like really kind of like drives you and makes you passionate about your area? Yeah, so I actually, Right after undergrad, I was working on completely different stuff. I was actually in the self-driving space. And along the way, I realized that one of the ways that we make our models so much better, the car is so much better, is like collecting data uh, from people. And I became really fascinated by this question of how do we get data from people? What is the right data to get? And how do we leverage that as effectively as possible? So I went back to do my PhD on reinforcement learning from human feedback, uh, specializing in active learning, interactive settings. And I feel super fortunate to be working on this in this space at this time when it's such a huge question. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, every day I feel like there's different challenges, different things we want to continue to improve on. So I feel very lucky to work on this. So maybe uh, just a quick question on, yeah. like how does this uh, interact with your day-to-day -day kind of role? Like what is it, uh, how does it impact the work that you're doing day-to-day? -day? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot about what it means to get data from people and what it means to improve models and how those two relate to each other. Mm -hmm. So for example, my team recently worked on Tau, um, Test Time Adaptive Optimization, which you might hear about uh, during this week. And one of the things there is that getting that type of data from people for fine tuning is extremely uh, time and cost intensive. And so we think really carefully, carefully about things like how do we make this process easier? And so Tau is a label free fine tuning method based on RL. Um, and so I feel very lucky to get to understand these things deeply and think about how we can continue to make them better for people who use these techniques. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Go on, tell us about your specialism. Yeah, so I've been leading data science for the past few roles. Um, I always had a passion for data, analytics, um, kind of math and sciences growing up. Um, I actually really enjoyed subjects like physics where you're you know, really explaining the world's phenomenon in terms of equations and math. And then I went on to specialize in math through my schooling. Um, you know, the first role that I had was actually working at Microsoft um, on developer tools. And so that was a great place to grow up in technology and really learn good engineering practices while we were developing tools for engineers directly. Go on, and what kind of tools were they? Yeah, so I was working on Visual Studio at the time. Um, oh. So code editing, debugging, um, never would I have imagined like <laughs> where we would be today. At that point, we were working on things like one word code completion called IntelliSense, mm -hmm. um, edit and debugging. Now you can just ask the AI to write the whole program for <laughs> you and find and fix the issues. So a whole different world. Oh, wonderful. And then how did it carry on from there? Yeah, so I think at that point I was in a product manager role and so I really enjoyed kind of going through that full cycle of ideation of the features and then getting the feedback from customers. Um, but increasingly I was interested beyond um, not just the qualitative but also quantitative feedback to understand kind of at scale and in aggregation how people were using the product and how we could use that information to continue to evolve it. And so 
we had a function called Experience and Insights. That was before data science was uh -huh. a thing. Now there's a lot more programs and yep. <laughs> um, foundation in this. But that was what I started in and then moved into data science as it became a function. And I led that role for Visual Studio and then later moved into Azure as cloud was growing. Um, and then after a couple decades at Microsoft, um, I decided to go um, beyond to another company. I worked at Twitter. Um, I went from enterprise to consumer. Um, Ooh, I went from kind of leading more internal machine learning models to the real time um, external models for our users. And then as AI was growing, um, I went to Google to lead data science for Gemini. And I was excited about how we could use data science to build better models and create better experiences. And then finally, Anthropic. Yeah, so in terms of kind of how this all relates to what your work is uh, Anthropic at the moment, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Sure. Um, honestly, we try to integrate data in all parts of the business. So whether it might be the way that we continue to evolve the product um, and understand the use cases that customers are using so we can create better experiences for them there, um, as well as the features. Um, we also engage with areas in our sales team, so in sharing, providing data to help us understand how we're nurturing and growing customers as they're adopting AI within their organizations. Um, we use it for capacity planning and optimization. So a number okay, of Okay, it sounds aspects. like a lot of dog fooding, I've got to say. <laughs> yes, we definitely <laughs> use the tools internally as well. That's been, I think, a great part of the experience to learn how we can disrupt ourselves and like what this function mm. will look like in the future over time. Okay, wonderful, yeah. thank you. Uh, and last but not least. Yeah, so I started out actually more as like an arts and English kind of kid, oh. and so I was in um, in in my undergraduate. Uh, I switched to more medicine-based uh, things, so I finally finished up my degree with a Bachelor's of Science and moved out to work in um, cardiac imaging uh, at a hospital, Johns Hopkins. And so working on clinical trials and, and you know, collecting the data and understanding some of the, the offshoots that we work with postdocs on, I ended up doing a Master's in Public Health studying epidemiology and biostatistics, and that was a really great way to sort of be hands-on with the data, but also in a way that's looking at sort of um, bigger, more long-term impacts. And so from there, I went and worked in like pharmacogenomics mm. and then in clinical trials again. And so at a certain point, I kind of hit this wall where I was like, if we're not going to sort of implement more machine learning in our space, um, I feel like we're going to kind of miss out on something. And so taking the, the work that we were trying to do and make it more efficient, more, um, more productive, but still in a way that is uh, trustworthy and uh, probably validating, you know, the ability to validate it for clinical trials. Uh, we came to a company, a biotech company, where we built out a data science and machine learning team. And so we worked with research and development to mm -hmm. understand what were their data needs were, how we could improve the data for more ML and AI purposes, um, built out a couple applications there, and then were acquired by Pfizer. So now at Pfizer, I lead AI innovation and data science for our R&D group. And again, it's kind of the same thing. What I love about it is, again, the domain is such that you're working with a lot of experts in the field. Mm. You know, if I do my job, they can uh, go far you know, together, but also go fast alone. And so my job is really to find that right balance sometimes between mm. a custom application that we can take time to develop together, but also maybe just provision the tools and the enterprise application and services quickly enough that they can develop quickly on their own. And so we we like, try to find this harmony between those um, machine learning engineers that are computationally intensive in the business of the researchers, but also provide them with additional support and needs that we can provide. But also we have those wet lab bench scientists that aren't going to be computationally heavy and we can support them with more machine learning and more automation. So those are the kind of things we do. We kind of spot check and find out small things that we can do, but also take a big picture look of um, you know, how can we build a better data marketplace? How can we provision more AI tools quickly and efficiently for you? How can we build you an application that's custom? And it should be custom because it's at the front edge of what we're doing, you know, within our own business. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. That's, uh, that's all so impressive from all of you. I'm quite humbled and feeling quite untalented right now, <laughs> frankly. Um, thank you. Um, but you've all had a very full, very interesting careers. And if I were to ask you to pick, like, maybe the most intense or defining 24 hours of your career, what would you choose and why? Oh goodness, I feel uncomfortable that I have to go first on this <laughs> one. Um, I would say the most intense 24 hours that I've had recently is you know, working on a global scale. You do have hours that overlap um, you know, from early to late. Um, and because of the fun things we get to do and doing a good job, you get called upon, you know, you know, there's travel. And so the last 24 hours that were very intense was, um, was a bit of a juggling act, you know, being able to, I was in a different country working with a team uh, that I'm building out there. 
but it was still taking calls early in the morning and late at night because there's other projects in the hopper. And so trying to find this balance in life where you're enjoying the fun of the sort of chaos and the, the good things, you know, if you oh, do yeah. it right, other people will want it done right, it's kind of thing. And so just trying to find that good balance. But but it's fun. It's 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 good to to have a team that can do such amazing work. Uh, obviously, I'm not promoting work-life balance when I talk about that, but you know, you have these days sometimes where you know you start on one project and you end on another, and you're touching different time zones and you know making that impact. I yeah, think that's yeah, really yeah. what it is. At the end of the day, are you making your customers happy? Are your is your team happy and enjoying it? And that was that was one of those 24 hours for me. Is, yeah. yeah, I think also in like a in a medical sense in a medical field as well. It's uh, easy to relate to people who kind of depend on this and the impact that your work is going to have. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure that adds to it. It certainly does, yeah. I think uh, from a scientist's perspective, you know, we kind of joke, if we've done our job right, they don't even know we're there. Um, <laughs> Right, and so sometimes the impacts are in numbers. Okay, <laughs> but yes, uh, customer satisfaction is way up there, and uh, you know, ultimately making a, a, a therapeutic that will get to customers quickly. And same question again. Uh, I'm sure, Anthropic, you've got many interesting 24-hour stories for us. Um, I would say working in AI probably the last 24 hours and. Also, like the last couple of weeks leading up to a model launch are definitely Ooh, very yep. exciting. Um, I think compared to prior software development, where you you know it's deterministic, you write the spec and then you're checking, do we complete the spec? Are there any bugs? You know, it's this non-deterministic space where you've built this creature essentially, yes. and then you're studying it, and yes. there's just a lot of suspense. You're running the final reinforcement learning run, seeing how good is this model going to be that we created, and then trying to understand, you know, between the different model candidates, how they compare, um, running different experiments, seeing what capacity you have to fill all the slots to run those in parallel. Mm. Um, and of course, we use AI to do all of this as quickly as possible. And so using AI for the model evaluations, using it to diagnose the differences between the different candidates um, and find the best solution, experimenting with different variations, et cetera. And I guess uh, once once a model has gone out into the world, that also must be a 10 to 24 hours because people are very opinionated about these things. You find out very quickly whether someone likes it or whether they don't. So oh yes, yeah. It's how does that work of one train, But it's really day one for then everything <laughs> afterwards because yeah, of course. Then you know, while we do have kind of early adopter programs leading up to the release, you get some early feedback and some experiments before that. Um, yeah, once it goes to the wild, it's a whole new ball game as well. Getting to look at the feedback at scale. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Polofi. This is a hard question. I was thinking about it. I was like, I don't, I don't know. But I think, especially after hearing um, what you had to say, I kind of agree. So when I joined Databricks, um, we, uh, so we were, I came in with the Mosaic team. We were training the DBRX model at that mm. time, which is an open source LLM. And yeah, I think, uh, like you said, the, just thinking back on it, the week and the day leading up to just like wrapping up and being like, all right, we're done with this, especially because the field moves really fast, mm. um, timelines get pulled, and it's kind of whenever we're working, in that case, on pre-training a model, but also like with Tau, where we're de like developing an algorithm or something, there's always this sense of like, maybe we can continue to push this and maybe we can get better numbers. And that kind of never ends until someone, uh, like at least on the research team, it never ends until someone's kind of like, this is when we're making the cut and whatever you have at this point is gonna go out. And I think that lead up to that, whenever someone is like, all right, this is the time, extremely intense. I think we work <laughs> super hard because everyone wants to showcase, right? Like, okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> these are the techniques we know. These are the algorithms we've developed. We think they're really good and we think we can con continue to push. Um, until we can't, so uh, yeah, it's kind of, and then you sleep it off for a long time after. <laughs> the recovery period. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay then, so I think we've got time for one last question, and uh, I think the question is going to be, um, Again, you've all got to very kind of senior levels of what it is that you're doing. As you kind of rose through the ranks, was there anything that you had to unlearn that did you well at the beginning of your career but started to hold you back towards the end of it? And was there something you had to unlearn and, and what was it? This is a good question. I feel still fairly early, um, but definitely for me, the thing that I had to unlearn was, so I worked for a few years prior to deciding to go and do my PhD. Mm -hmm. And that was a very difficult decision because I was doing really well. I was at a company that was and still is exceedingly cool. Um, and I felt like I was on the cutting edge. I felt like it was gonna go somewhere. 
and deciding to take a step that felt like a non-linear improvement okay. was very hard. And I really was like, it's a very type A person who was like, here's my plan, I can see what the future holds here, I believe in this vision. Um, but I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing now, which I love, if I hadn't just said, I'm really passionate about this question, and even if this doesn't feel like a step forward right now, I'm going to trust in my gut that mm -hmm. this will be something important. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was definitely something that I had to spend some time on learning. Okay. Yeah, that like need for a linear improvement. Okay then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I yeah. uh, yeah, nod all around the table there. I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay then, go on. Unlearnings that you've had to make. Great. I think for me it was the done is better than perfect. Mm. Um, I think particularly in this profession where we have the techniques, we have the models where we can create really precise solutions, um, being able to balance that with the time to market um, and find when are the places where an 80-20 solution is really the best approach. And so that might be anything from looking at a model and maybe there is a top predictive feature that gets you like 80% of the way. So just implementing it that way to start and then you can get early feedback and even validate the approach. Um, and yeah, and sometimes that's actually all you need long term. So there's still kind of a time and place. Sometimes, you know, eking out that last percent of performance is actually worthwhile in a broad optimization problem. But many of these solutions, I think, you know, finding ways that you can apply the 80-20 the solution and um, works great. And I often ask myself, you know, are we making better decisions today than we made yesterday? If so, let's take that step. Okay, then. no, that's good advice. Thank you. And last um, but not least. I definitely identify with both of those and it will probably come out in my, my answer as well but um, probably the biggest thing I had to unlearn was a, a hold on what the future exactly looked like. A lot of my job is coming up with an idea of that future and being sort of future proof like looking over the fence and seeing what else is out there. Once I get the team up and running on sort of the, the current you know, uh, field posts that we're trying to get to and then looking out ahead and seeing what that next finish line is. I've had to let go of things that I'm good at. You know, I'm no longer a coder, unfortunately. I'm a really great leader and having to learn those leadership skills mm -hmm. is, is also practice that you get to invest back into yourself. So trying to similarly, you know, take a leap of faith in a new direction, but also putting that, um, you know, engineer mindset to learning a new skill or a new practice because again, the frontier is changing. Those, you know, finish lines keep moving further out. And so that adaptability is something that um, I've had to embrace by sort of unlearning the, the kind of some of the pride I had and maybe being an expert in something else in the past, yeah, to regrow. Okay then, thank you. Uh, they are some wonderful answers. No, thank you so much for your honesty, uh, being able to talk about your experience uh, and your work. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. No worries. You. Uh, so that's all we've got time for, unfortunately. But again, thank you so much to our guests who've been joining us today. Um, we hope you stay tuned for many more of our segments today. Thank you.